Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafiroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, a fascinating woman. Her name, Tova Felchu. And Tova is, of course, known as an actress, singer, playwright, author, and philanthropist. Let's all welcome Tova Feltschut. And Tova, it is so great to have you here on Successful Philanthropy. And Tova, first off, thank you for all you've done. You are such a role model to so many different women and men. But before we go into that, let's talk about how you first got involved in show business what was your first real big break? Well, I was a classical pianist and uh, was trained like many people who have all European grandparents that a cultured person speaks at least two languages and plays a classical instrument. And I had the honor and pleasure of going to the National Music Camp in Interlock in Michigan and competed for concertos. And for two seasons in a row, I got to the finals and lost. And when that happened, I said, Tova Felchu, you, you're going to be an, an also-ran. What can you do well? So I applied to do plays that had music in them. And I was immediately cast as Cousin Hebe in HMS Pinafore um, uh, amongst a group of 110 campers at NMC. And I said, it isn't a big part, but it's a part. And there aren't many. There was Buttercup, but there was a lead, and there was Cousin Hebe. And that is how I switched from classical music to plays with music and ultimately into theater. And I think as a solo instrumentalist, I didn't want to be alone. That maybe had I been a violinist or, an, or a person in an orchestra, I would have had a different fate. But five hours a day in that cinder block cabin in Michigan, Dunn did me in. So I, I applied uh, for a second, for a minor in theater. And uh, thanks to a man named Dude Stevenson, my little life turned a corner. The other corner it turned at that camp is that there was a young girl named Lori Levy who looked just like me. We became very, very close friends. She had this older brother, and I would visit her in Washington, and the older brother was at Andover, and the older brother was at Harvard, and the older brother was never there. And then the older brother came to see Yentl, February 16, 1976, and I would marry him. He was my husband. He is my husband of 45 years. So I met my life's work and my life's partner through National Music Camp. So I would say that was my huge big break on a human level. And then on a professional level, I, I won the McKnight Fellowship to the Guthrie right after I graduated from Sarah Lawrence. And the Guthrie mounted one show, which was a play with music starring Christopher Plummer called Cyrano. And that play would go from the Guthrie to the Royal Alex in Toronto to the Colonial Theater in Boston and open at the Palace Theater. So I came to New York on Broadway with 14 lines in a red dress and understudying the leading lady. And uh, I, within 18 months of that, I got very, very lucky. Uh, my name by this time, I was born Terry Sue, which I talk about in my memoir, and I changed my name to Tova when I got to university. Um, within the 18 months of coming to New York in Cyrano, I was awarded the role of Yentl in Yentl the Yeshiva Boy by Isaac Pesheva Singer. And that moved from Brooklyn Academy to the O'Neill Theater, where... And yeah. how old were you back then? 23, 23, 24. So you became very famous at a very young age. And how did that feel? And, and I mean, and it how did you handle it? It felt great. And I don't think I knew fully how to do it. I don't think I understood that the head of a company is much more than the head of a company. If you look at Harvey Firestein and the Menches who are on Broadway, and I hope I'm among them now, that the head of a company, the person with the most lines and the final bow, uh, is a person who's also responsible for the, the theater community in which, in which we exist. So I had to learn that uh, through Yentl. And by the time I got to Sarava and Lend Me a Tenor, and of course Gold is Balcony and to Pippin, I understood uh, what my place was in that universe, whether it was supporting or whether it was a lead. Uh, but uh, and what to do with that. And it has a lot more to do than just being great on stage, if you're lucky enough to be decent enough in your part. It has to do with taking care of people, being gracious, making sure you give stage, which I'm very good at. I, my directors always say, would you please stop turning your back to the audience? But I figure when it's somebody else's turn 
throw the ball to them because the story needs to be told. So for the story to be clear, you have to give stage. You have to give the next person their chance to keep the, the script moving. And no question, once you were a star on Broadway, you, you were, in fact, a role model for others. And everyone looked to you. And if you took one step in the wrong direction, you probably would have been shot down. So you were very careful and you learned at a young age that with a big role and, a, and, and a stardom comes a responsibility, responsibility to those you work around and then responsibility to the world. Now, I know you as a woman with a big heart and also a big sense of humor. Has your sense of humor ever gotten you into trouble? Ah, uh, probably sometimes I'm too frank. I had a mother who was very direct. She was from the Bronx. And when I was a little girl, she had had elocution lessons as a child along with her sisters, Rose, Nancy, and May. Her parents were immigrants, so they all spoke like I'm speaking to you now. But I noticed as my mother got older, she kind of reverted to some speech pattern she heard when, when she was 11 years old, you know, when the Yankee Stadium was being built, whatever. Um, my sense of humor. Yes, I hope I, I hope I, humor. I hope I hope I hope I hope I don't offend. I mean, everybody has their picadillos. I I um, I think if I was a model for anything in my young years, it was that my I was a hard worker. I really feel that you have to give it your best shot, and it's still a trigger for me, a trigger I'm working on. When work is not well done, it it does trigger me. But I I obviously muzzle myself so. I love to work with people, but I hope to heck they give it their best shot. And if they do, and the work is still what I feel is not up to par, I say to myself, who the heck am I to judge them? You're on the tennis court with them. Make it work or get another partner. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. Once I'm in a cast, everybody's great. That's it. You just suspend judgment, and you get on the ball field and pass the ball. And by telling the truth, I worked with Andy Lincoln in The Walking Dead, Anybody who works with Andy Lincoln, their work gets better. That's how decent and remarkable he is. He's such a great actor, and he's such a humble actor that just being around him, you imbibe his virtues. And that's what I hope at this age, I've been on Broadway 48 years, that I'm able to benefit uh, other people. And you do. And I think for a lot of people, Toba, they look up to you. And women look up to you. Men look up to you because you're a role model. Now, I understand you've been involved not just in the world of theater and acting, but you're also a philanthropist. And that's something that a lot of people don't know about you. We honored you this summer at the Ellen Hermanson Foundation back in August of 2021. And you were so inspirational to so many women who are battling breast cancer and are breast cancer survivors. And and now I know you're involved with a number of other charities. And tell me, what is your favorite charity? Well, I love them all, but of course I'm involved in the Middle East and through the graces of my short but intense relationship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the very generous Supreme Court Justice whom we lost so sadly September 18th of last year. She just had her one year anniversary, which we call the yard site of her death. Um, she was very active in Hand in Hand, which educates Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs, so Muslims and Jews, little children, educates them together at a young age, puts them together, if you will, like our wonderful President Eisenhower did in 1952, which demanding the integration of schools so that, um, so that peace has a possibility in the Middle East. I also uh, believe in peace now, which is the bartering of land for peace. Uh, this hasn't always worked out. Uh, you know, love is strong and hate is strong, but trust is fragile. And um, how do you build trust between people? Well, a lot of psychologists, and I, who am not a psychologist, believe if you start early enough. You know, President Truman was the first person, first person on the earth, the first president, and of course of America, to recognize Israel. Do you know why? Because he was in business with a wonderful Jewish man early in his years, and they had a marvelous partnership, a partnership of honesty and trust. And it was through his relationship with that man that he felt the Jewish people, particularly after the Holocaust, 
needed a place to survive, to hang their hats. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to work it out with what Golda Meir calls our Arab neighbors. And now, of course, Israel is opening up trade relations with Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain. It's, it's, it's a remarkable time. So I'm active in hand in hand. I'm active in the um, uh, Peace Now movement. And I'm also active, of course, in the Hermanson Fund. And I'm active in a, another group for which I did their gala, um, Gift of Life, which uh, pairs bone marrow, people who are in need in bone marrow in order to survive with their, res uh, with their bone marrow donors. And I do that through my friend Wendy Siegel. A lot of my, who, who is the most remarkable soldier of life that I think I've ever met, I've never seen a battle against death, the way Wendy Siegel wages it. And I, I take my hat off to you, Wendy, every day. I take my hat off to you. And uh, it's interesting, as you, as you talk to me, I realize that my charitable work is born out of relationship, not out of cause. It first comes from a friendship, a, a road in. Of course, I give well, money to Sarah Lawrence College. I have the, the Tova Felchu Broadway Ticket Fund, which you give us you, the interest from that fund, which I've built up over the years, provides the, the students at Sarah Lawrence to go to any Broadway show, opera, or ballet at Lincoln Center free, you know, based on I buy the tickets for them. They have to go in pairs, and they have to write a thank you note. I have to make sure that they're going where they say they're going, so it's transmit, receive, acknowledge. So clearly you are a philanthropist and someone very involved also in Israel. Now you received an award in Israel, I think a peace award. Talk about that a little bit. And then you've been, you've gotten so many different awards around the world and you've had so many Tony nominations and so many great things happening to you because of what you do on stage and off stage. And and I want you to talk about your relationship with Israel just for a few minutes and that award you received there. Um, it's the Israel Peace Medal. I also received the Israel Friendship Award. I also received the Eleanor Roosevelt Humanitas Award and Hadassah Mother of the Year. You know, the Jewish people are uh, remarkable and very clever if they if they have a way to raise money around you for just and righteous causes, they will ask you to be honored at a dinner, you know? All charities. Yeah. I always say when yeah. someone is honored, they're not being honored just because they're a good person. They're being honored for the donation they can give and also the contacts and people they can bring to that charity and visibility. And certainly you can do all three. And now, uh, for our audience, uh, we are with Tova Feltshu. She is a famous actress. She is a famous singer. She is a philanthropist, playwright, and also an author, which brings me to your book. You recently wrote a book all about, I think, yourself and your relationship with your mother and your daughter. And the name of that book is Lilyville. The name of the book is Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played. It is published by Hachette. And I am very grateful that during the pandemic, this was my primary focus. And I had a very good publisher, and Lauren Marino, my wonderful editor, um, uh, advised me in the crafting of this memoir. I did not feel that I merited a celebrity memoir. I am not an international movie star. Those of us who have the privilege of starring on Broadway or being on Broadway, I call us local talent. We're beloved, we're treasured, but- You're very humble. The I pond mean, is- This is uh, very silly, it's, really. <laughs> it's not, uh, I don't, don't think the pond reaches all around the world, but what I did, what I did know is that uh, in trying to get to the universal, what what is it that is in the, uh, river, the common river of profound human experience. Well, the parent-child relationship. All of us have parents or we wouldn't be walking this earth. And that goes for the animal world as well, for many, many different species besides ours. So my mother, Lily Kaplan felt she lived till over 103 years old. And I said, what if I write a memoir about my life through my mother's eyes and my mother's life through mine, which spans, my, I was born when my mother was 40. So it spans not one generation, but two. 
So is it divided in two parts? The My book? mother, no, it's actually written as in a theater structure. Instead of, I wrote it in three acts with two intermissions. And instead of having a forward, you have an overture. And you have a program note where it says, you know, please turn off your cell phones, but, but pictures are more than welcome. <laughs> so it has a great deal of humor. Instead of having an afterword, it has exit music. Instead of having acknowledgments, I give a cast party and acknowledge the many people um, who helped me, particularly uh, Jeff Harner and uh, Oliver Scholson, uh, my assistant and my dear friend, who were in the writer's room for much of it when I was getting this, this book up and out. And instead of chapters, I give you scenes. What it does is it exact. My mother was born before women's suffrage. She was born April the 18th, 1911. Before women's suffrage, before World War I. Bef she grew up in the Roaring Twenties. On April 18th, 1923, her 12th birthday, Yankee Stadium opened. And the New York Yankees beat the Red Sox 4-1 to one because Babe Ruth hit a Grand Slam home run. And the Kaplans, who could see Yankee Stadium from their apartment at 1534 Charlotte Street, where my mother was born on a dining room table, were Yankee fans ever since. She was born during the, she was alive during the crash, during the Great Depression, and World War II before she was 30 years old. And I was born in the lap of the second movement of the women's liberation uh, uh, movement. Uh, Letty Pogrebin, uh, Gloria Steinem, they were ahead of us. Jane Fonda, this is generation ahead. The, bo the bras were burned. Um, it was the roaring 20s. We had the pill and we had no AIDS. And it was a different different time, a time of great experimentation, of Woodstock, things like that. Walk on the Moon, actually a picture that I did where, where America walked on the moon. Neil Armstrong. Right, one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. And um, uh, it shows, in, in tracing my relationship with my mother, it shows the evolution of women's rights and the sexual revolution in America and covers 110 years of American women's history in my effort to, so that if somebody not from my background and not from my ethnicity and not from my religion can be moved by the book because it hits enough of universal values that apply to them, not just to me. Women. And, Women. and look at what's going on in the world right now. We have a situation where we live in a country where the Equal Rights Amendment isn't even part of our Constitution. Right. We don't have equal rights between men and women. And across the world, we see women who are no longer able to go to school now in Afghanistan mm -hmm. or get an education. That hurts me. It must hurt you. I wish we could do something uh, to end that and to make the rest of the world see how important it is. I think the first thing we have to do is overturn that horrendous situation in Texas where women are being denied abortions. I'm with RBG, that a woman, woman has a right to her own body. And, and gentlemen, you would never allow us to ask this of you. Never. Never. And that's very true. And, I agree uh, with you. So and it's a funny time. And then also, but around the world, how could women not be viewed as the equal to men? I don't understand Just get that. fundamentalism of any religion, whether it's mine, whether it's what's happening in Afghanistan. The, woman, the minute a woman is put under a shadur, that isn't just a physical uh, state of being of covering her up. That's a metaphor for the whole, for the whole deal. It's really get back in the tent. You get back in the tent. And I like going, that. Yeah. And I'm with you on that. Now, you have a husband, and you have a son and a daughter. I do. And I know you're very proud of all of them, and I'm sure they're very proud of you. What was it like for your daughter, especially growing up with such a famous and important woman? You know, my mother, Lily, uh, again, the memoir, Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and other roles I played. Uh, we used to do this in the Kaplan. She was a Kaplan clan. If you couldn't bring up your children, my mother would go like this, which means you're a flea. You're nothing. If you can't bring up your children, you are nothing. So I was brought up with that value, where the children really came first. And one of my children did not learn to read while I was busy starring on Broadway. And I didn't pick it up. And I didn't pick it up. My beloved sister-in-law, Joan Firth, is a reading therapist. She came to me and she said, Tova, 
this child is not reading. I said, of course the child is reading. He said, no. He's just memorized language. He's memorized the sound of it. He's not decoding language. And that year, the school he went to, which is the most prominent boys' school, uh, one of the three most prominent boys' schools in New York, uh, just decided to teach the whole reading program. They called it the W-H-O-L-E. I call it the H-O-L-E reading program, as opposed to teaching phonics. And uh, I hired a tutor for our, it was our son, and he learned to read in six weeks. But the point is, when he didn't, when I didn't catch that, and uh, I stopped, uh, I stopped starring on Broadway. I really did, in unlimited runs, until he got into college. He got into college, my daughter, our daughter Amanda was at Spence, and she went to Switzerland for a semester, and I went back to Broadway with Goldust Balcony. It was, it was not an accident that this happened. And now, what's on the horizon for you? Well, I have two wonderful opportunities. Uh, uh, the first one is on October 16th and 17th. I will be in concert at the Meisner Park Cultural Center, the Meisner Performing Arts Center in Boca, doing Tauve is Leona. And I'll be playing the <laughs> realtor, uh, Leona Helmsley, also known as the Queen of Mean, and in a riotous um, concert that I wrote with Jeff Harner, my director, and uh, James Bossy, my musical director, uh, marvelous people, where Leona Hel Leona Helmsley is up from purgatory for 60 minutes to set the record straight and sing a few show tunes. It's our time for making everything and so up for top of the world all my afterlife I have had two dreams one is to get out of purgatory and through the pearly gates and the other one is to star in my own cabaret show <laughs> and I think you love that role oh I, I do <laughs> and you're good at it uh, she had a great rivalry with Don Donald Trump you know back in the real estate days where she used to say I wouldn't trust a thing he said if his tongue was certified so it was very, very funny, their whole relationship. How do you feel about that? Well, I th you know, he, when she was down, he wrote her a, a very caustic letter. I deal with it in the, in the act. So come see me in, in Boca or tell your friends. And then on December 4th, I'm coming to New York in Becoming Dr. Ruth by Mark St. Germain, directed by my director of Goldust Balcony, Scott Schwartz, and thanks to the graces of Bay Street with the Museum of Jewish Heritage and a, a, uh, another partner named Gold Division. We are opening at the gorgeous Safra Hall where the Yiddish version of Fiddler last played. And they just put two or three million dollars into this exquisite, uh, almost 400 seat theater inside the Museum of Jewish Heritage at the tip of Manhattan overlooking the Statue of Liberty. I will be playing Dr. Ruth Westheimer and I will be doing her backstory because she never presents her backstory at all. She always just presents that she's this riotous, brilliant uh, international sex therapist, but she has an amazing journey. And how this child who was put on a kinder transport and have her mother, father, and grandmother murdered at Auschwitz while she was between the ages of 10 and 16, while she was isolated in Switzerland, uh, and how she went from that to becoming Dr. Ruth Westheimer is remarkable. Well, the she has a heart of gold. I've met her many times, and I have a lot of admiration for her. She's funny, she's kind, she's giving, she's philanthropic like you. She's and, really. And so you played this role also this past summer. I did. At the Bay Street Theater. I did. In East, in Sag uh, in Harbor. In Sag Harbor. Yes, and, and I think you received rave reviews, as I recall, and it was sold out. That was back in June. Now, getting back to you, Someday, someone's going to make a movie about your life. Wow. I'm sure if of only. it. Who would you like to play you? Wow. Who will be Tova? The girl that starred in The Americans. Or Natalie Portman. I'll take Natalie Portman any oh, day. She's a great beauty, and so are you. Oh, and yeah. She's also, she's Israeli, I she's believe. She's Israeli, correct? went to yes, Harvard. 
Her parents are professors. She's uh, she's something. I've met her a few times. She's, she's charming, something. absolutely beautiful, right. and of course a great great actress. Yes, like you. Oh, <laughs> very, very 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 kind. I've been offered a movie to play Anthony Hopkins' wife called Armageddon. Now we're just negotiating that deal. Uh, I just. The truth about that is we still have to sign a contract, but I have been made the offer, and I was very pleased about that. You think you'll sign it? I absolutely will. Who doesn't want to be with Anthony Hopkins on the silver screen? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. No, it would be, be a wonderful opportunity. And then my dear, brilliant friend Jonathan Shapiro has written a play called Sisters-in-Law and has offered me the part along with his producer to play a Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's a part I created in... Uh, Los Angeles for Jonathan Shapiro's de uh, Los Angeles debut with that play, and it's my relationship with Sandra Day O'Connor, and it is hopefully coming into New York in the spring of 2022 or sometime in 2022. Depends on the COVID, the COVID situation. And I understand during COVID you can you still worked, I think. I, I wrote my memoir. I wrote my memoir. I handed it in in December of 2019. My my editor said, this is brilliant, but it's not a book. I said, what? She said, a bunch of pearls. It's a bunch of pearls on a coffee table that aren't strung together. And I went back and I rewrote the entire thing. And that's when Jeff Harner said to me, Tova, what do you know best? I said, I guess I know theater best. He said, write it as a theater piece. And it was like an explosion went off. That one sentence from a dear, brilliant friend. And I rewrote, restructured the whole thing. And now you have Lilyville, which has been optioned uh, by Hollywood and hopefully will become a TV series. And if so, I will be playing my mother, so anybody who has hearing problems shouldn't worry about a thing. So that's what I'll be doing. And how can we buy that book? You can buy it. Lilyville. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at Target. You can buy it at Barnes and Nobles or indie bookstores. And if you're lonely, just go on www.tovafelchu.com. And you, and, you know, you double-click on, on various links, and it'll take you right to Target. It'll take you to Amazon. It'll take you to Barnes & Noble. It's on sale. It's doing very well, and, uh, and I'm thrilled about that. Now, this show is all about philanthropy. You told us about your philanthropy, but what advice do you go to the people watching this show, younger people who maybe want to follow your fifth steps have a career and also be a philanthropist? Well, the first thing you do, again, in my particular religion, and I'm not asking you to be my particular religion, is a, uh, a, a commandment of sadaka. It's actually a commandment to give charity. And it's supposed to you know, give you good karma. The most important thing is to find a righteous cause that you believe in and at least write the check. It doesn't have to be a big check. I started with checks of $18 because 18 in Hebrew is high for life. So that's a good luck uh, number numerologically. So then it went from 18 to 36 and 36 to 72, 72 to 118 to $1,800 to whatever I could do. And um, that, that's the, mo the most important thing is connection. And then if you can't write the check, give the sweat. Because the sweat equity is fantastic. And there are many charities where I don't give anything, but I give my services for nothing. You know, whether it's the Israel Philharmonic, whether it's the gift of life to MC their evenings. You know, I you know, pay for my cab fare and uh, maybe a blow dry of my hair. And you don't collect any uh, personal appearance fees and you help that uh, charity put, forgive me now, asses in the seats. Because sometimes with certain, uh, with, when you're giving an event, if you have certain people of perceived value, whether it's the wonderful Alec Baldwin, who's a local here, or Mercedes Rule, or Joy Behar, or Angela LaGreca, that those people can put uh, human beings, uh, can bring human beings into um, the actual benefit performance, and, and therefore they can propagate funds for that cause. Stay connected. You know, that's one gift of COVID. It took away our face-to-face -face connection. And it, it's such a, a privilege, such a privilege to be in the, in the company of another human being. They say it's an endorphin. You don't have to take drugs or take 
liquor. It's an endorphin in and of itself. And I agree. And I think during COVID, we all felt very disconnected. Mm -hmm. And getting back into the life we used to have, well, it takes a little time. It also takes a little work. And for our audience, we've just gone through a horrific pandemic. It's not over yet. No. But make the effort to reach out to friends so that you can stay connected and take the time to share and give a little love. And I like your advice, Tover, on philanthropy. I wrote a book on philanthropy, that book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. And in that book, I explain that we give our time, we give our knowledge, and we can also advocate. Now, if you don't have a lot of money, well, you give your time. But for those who have resources, financial resources, well, we all have an obligation to open up our hearts and open up our wallets. And Tova, we have a few minutes left. And as you look back on your life, and I know you're going to have many years ahead of you. Your mother passed away at the age of 103. And you're very far from that age. You have at least another 50 years to go, I'm <laughs> Thank sure. You. From your I'm mouth. I'm sure of that, yes. And so when you look back, what are you most proud of? And again, what 50 years from now, when you look back, what do you think you'll be most proud of? At this moment, I'm most proud that I had the fortune to marry Andrew Harris Levy and give birth to Garson Brandon Levy and to Amanda Claire Levy. That and worked out. they're both out very successful people, I've very, read. <laughs> very, very. And you're very humble. I hope, I, I hope so. I, I, uh, I, I really got lucky in the mate situation. And I always say, if you marry for love, love always returns. And stay on the field of play. Stay on the field of play. That every, I know it's a big thing now. You can divorce. It's all very convenient. But children need two parents. They need a mom and dad, however you want to make it up, or a mom and mom, or a dad and dad. But I remember when Brandon went to Harvard, he was, the, there were five boys. He was the Jew from New York who would play soccer for Harvard. There was the Indian boy from New Jersey who would play tennis for Harvard. There was the Catholic boy from Pittsburgh on a football scholarship. There was the African-American boy who was a, a cheerleader. And there was another child well, there wasn't, maybe there wasn't, maybe it's just the four of them, but they all had one thing in common. They all had a mother and a father. And I remember experiencing that. One father was actually a paraplegic in a, in a wheelchair. That there, there was a phalanx of support. So I would say, uh, marry like a Jew, divorce like a Catholic. Don't rush into marriage, but if you're gonna get married once there are children, think, think, think deeply before you break those alliances up. And I agree with that. I've had a long marriage myself. Yeah. I have two daughters. And I think the secret to a good marriage is to have a very short memory and never go to bed angry. Okay. Go to bed ready to make love always, That's right? Great. Right. And my, as my mother says, you want to have a good marriage? I'll show you how to have a good marriage. Just shut one eye. That's what she used to say. Just shut and one she, eye. In many ways, she's right. You have to be able to forgive and forget and move on. Short memory, close one eye. That's right. And keep the marriage going. And because it, it does hurt a lot of people when a marriage breaks up, and it mostly hurts the children. And today, it's hard to meet the right person with COVID and everything else. Everybody's afraid. Yeah, I afraid. can't imagine and what And now that's like. people are afraid to get too near somebody, vaccinated or not vaccinated. Right. I, I no longer shake hands. I give an elbow. Yes. And I, I don't care. I, I want to keep healthy, and I want to keep those around me in good health. And I think it's all very, very important. And so now you're at 103. You're like your mom, and you've looked back on your life. And... And uh, it's been your family, I guess, that's really meant the most to you. And of course, yes. I think what you've been able to leave this world. I, I think in your, again, in the Jewish tradition, your more immortality is through the, the children, is, is we say, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. And a lot of this knowledge about Judaism is because of the fact that my birth name is Terry Sue Felchu, when I fell in love with Michael Fairchild from Cold Spring Harbor, Long Island, 
um, when he was at Wesley, and he said, what kind of a name is Terry Sue for a girl like you? What else were you called? I said, I was called Tova at Sunday school. It was really Hebrew school. And he went, Tova, now that's a name. A lot of this knowledge is not because I went to Jewish day school, because I didn't. I was uh, like a cheerleader at Quaker Ridge School in Scarsdale High. Uh, not a cheerleader at Scarsdale High, but at Quaker Ridge. And it is because I've been typecast. My perceived value was this maven, uh, an, an expert in Judaism. So. I, I'm a hard worker. I studied up, studied up. So we base our immortality in naming our children after the honored, after the honored dead. And uh, so the next generation is is uh, very important. What would I hope to do if I look back on a hundred th- from 103? I would hope that I had progressed and eradicated all my unconscious bias. I was brought up in a world where there was segregation, even in the North, where uh, my bunch was not allowed into many country clubs, many horseback riding clubs, many places, many, many places where there were people who camouflaged who they were so they could be Jews who passed. I mean, the movie stars, when I kept my name Tova Felchu, I had Robbie Lance come up to me and said, you'll never be on a marquee. And that was in 1974. You'll never be on a marquee, and not I with a name like that. And I love your ideas about eradicating was... all sorts of prejudice. Yes, yes, and that people so that were not even aware of it. And, and I think with the whole um, racial justice movement, which is so incredibly important, it goes beyond just racial justice, but also religious justice. I want to say one thing you didn't know about me. I'm a Catholic, but I served on the board of the Jewish board for 28 years as a Catholic. And what I learned was the following. Number one, we're all, all worshiping a higher being. We're just doing it in different ways. Right. And I now am an honorary trustee for the Jewish board. That charity serves 60,000 New Yorkers in New York City. 60% are not Jewish. People don't know that about a Jewish charity. Yep. And when we think about religion, well, all religions teach the importance of giving back, and certainly Judaism does. And when you look at the history of giving, it's the Jews that have given the most per person. And that's a beautiful thing. And I think it's something in the Torah that says, as a Jew, you're required or you're supposed to give 10% of your earnings. Tithing. Which is very, very special. And in uh, Catholicism and in Christianity, in Islam, in, in the Hindu religion, in Buddhism, it's very, very important that we take care of all those who have less than us. It's just so incredibly important because at the end of the day, what did we do with our life? Did we just go and play golf all day long? Did we just think about our own? No, we have to think about others. And I love that you've done so much for this world. And it's a way of making the world your family. It's a way of turning your life into a vision of the of of the family of of mankind, not just f- being a good Nick yourself, but it's uh, it it's 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 better. The, it's for the greater good. A lot less mugging if we take care of people. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And when there is so much inequity in this world, people that have a lot, and then so many ha- who have so little. Well, we all have an obligation and. I think we're on the same page here, and I want to thank you. And if there's anything you'd like to add, please do, because truly it's a great, great pleasure to have you on Successful Philanthropy, to learn more about you as a human being. I've read about you always. I've met you this past summer at the Ellen Hermanson Foundation. You are a fantastic woman. You've done so much. What else do you want to leave us with? Two minutes. Just that um, if you look for the good in other people, you will find it, and you will keep relocating the good in yourself. And if you look for the bad, you'll find that too. And you'll get that in touch with you. So what do you want to live with? What do you want to live with as yourself? Do you want to be your angry self, your spiteful self, the one with, uh, we say, broigus, the one with grudges, the one with judgment, so much judgment that it separates you from mankind? 
or do you want to be with your best self, the more accepting, the one with the big tent, the one who at least will stay neutral and curious? Stay curious. God knows what we'll learn if we just stay curious so that before we go to uh, uh, entrenching in any kind of enemy or I-thou relationship, a bifurcated relationship, that you, you stay curious to try to at least authentically listen to points of view that can deeply, deeply disagree with yours. But somehow you might be able to connect with that person. I'd love to leave, meet the lawmakers in Texas who are passing these uh, anti-abortion, these very tough anti-abortion laws, uh, which tell women how to behave, because I have things to learn about this, why so much is at, at stake for them. And that's, that's my advice. Keep your tent big, keep your heart huge. Keep your heart as big as Texas. <laughs> well, I agree with you that a woman has a right to choose, and I agree with just about every word you said today. So thank you very much, Tova. This pleasure. was a great, great pleasure. I hope you'll come back on the show again in a year or even sooner. Okay. Thank you. And this concludes Successful Philanthropy. Our guest today, Tova Feltshoe. She is an actress, she is a playwright, a mother, an author, and a singer. Let's all thank her, and I'll see you next week.